Listen up, get ready, I'm not gonna take no more. There's a revolution, a revelation going on in my soul. Buckle up, get ready, we're not gonna say no. Okay, out there, everybody, it's time for another edition of Live from the Heartland, and I'm Michael James, your host for this week's edition. This is for the week of April 1st. No fool, it really is. And we've got a really wonderful guest coming up. I've got uh, Angela Clay, who is running for Alderwoman in the 46th Ward. She's in the runoff. The election is Tuesday the 4th. And an old friend, uh, James W. Russell, who told us about uh, uh, some of the books he's written, some films he's written, and gave us his view on Oklahoma, et cetera, et cetera. Um, one of the big things uh, coming up this week, I'll get to in a minute. First, I like to usually uh, talk about something good that happened, and I'll say a couple of things. This past Friday, I went to a benefit uh, for Free Street Theater, which does free theater in the parks, and it was a wonderful event. I'm very uh, happy to say it's my daughter, Koya Paz, who is the uh, artistic director of Free Street and had a lot to do with this event, and we had a really good time down in Pilsen. Um, and another good thing is, uh, as some of you know, I have a photo show that is up at Yuri Eichen. You can go see it by appointment, contact Yuri Eichen Gallery, uh, but there will be a closing reception on the 7th. And for the last week, I've been working along with uh, uh, David, one of my sons, David Libman, as well as Hal, and we're getting a book ready, and we will show you a picture of the book. Uh, it should be out sometime pretty quickly, and it's uh, based on the exhibit. So I'm really happy about that. Uh, big thing here in town is the election on Tuesday the 4th. It's a mayoral election, and it gives people a stark choice. I hope people are really paying attention. We don't want to go backwards. And uh, in addition to that, uh, there is election in Wisconsin. Anyone you know up there call for their Supreme Court. Uh, and it's going to make a difference not only in how Wisconsin is governed, but it has ramifications for the nation as a whole. Um, on the labor front, uh, this week we saw uh, the owner of Starbucks, Schultz, go up against Bernie in Congress. Um, just weeks after the National Labor Relations Board accused Starbucks of engaging in egregious. Okay, hold on. Here you go. Just weeks after National Labor Relations Board accused Starbucks of engaging in egregious, egregious and widespread misconduct to prevent employees from unionizing, the company's longtime CEO, Howard Schultz, appeared before the Senate's Health, Education, Labor, and Pensions Committee to answer questions. Um, and he made a big case for how they treat all the workers right. But as many of you know from listening to this show or reading the paper, over 300 Starbucks locations have voted to have a union. They have yet to have the opportunity to sign a contract. Okay. Um, here in the 49th Ward, you know, there was a big issue about the homeless encampment up at Chase Park. Uh, the alderwoman, Maria Haddon, was working on it hard. Uh, the opponents in the race were trying to use it against her. She made real efforts to, to move that thing along. And if you drive by Chase Park now, there are no more tents and people are being attended to in much better fashion. Uh, internationally, you know, uh, Bolsonaro, who lost the election down there in Brazil, uh, he's been hanging out in Florida, eating at uh, McDonald's, that kind of thing. Uh, well, Lula, the new president down there uh, in Brazil, he took away the security details, so Bolsonaro has had to go back to Brazil, and likely he and Donald Trump up here, they're like two cousin kind of guys, are going to face charges. On the film that is out on PBS called uh, The Movement and the Madman uh, the, by American Experience, a lot of uh, my friends at SDS on an email were chiming in, and we're going to talk a little bit later with James Russell about it. But Clark Kissinger, who incidentally did run for alderman back in the 60s, up here in the 49th Ward, and since then has been involved with some revolutionary activity. He said uh, about the film, which is about the anti-war movement, the mass mobilizations were very important, and it's unfortunate that SDS pulled back from organizing them. But we should not forget all the four factors that actually brought the war to an end. First and most important, the Vietnamese would not capitulate. 
Second, the U.S. Army in Vietnam became increasingly dysfunctional as a good section of the soldiers turned against the war. Third, anti-war actions, together with Black Liberation Movement, threatened the stability of society at home. And fourth, uh, Scoop Jackson and the Committee to, on the Present Danger argued within the ruling class that the real danger was the Soviet Union and Vietnam was a waste of time and resources. Uh, he goes on, uh, it is a good film. I'm calling your attention to it. And once again, it is called uh, The Movement and the Madman. And it's about the anti-war movement around 1969 going up against Nixon. A uh, couple of tragedies this week that we're going to have to pay a little attention on. Uh, in Nashville, at a Christian school, a young former student entered, killed three adults and three nine-year-olds nine before she was killed. And down in El Paso, Juarez, across the border in Mexico, migrants were killed in a Juarez fire. Many of those killed and injured were reportedly rounded up earlier on Monday, that was a couple of days ago, by Mexican can officials. Uh, there was a tragedy in the Juarez Detention Center, uh, sparks anger and calls for change. Horrific fire claimed 38 lives, people being held rather than being able to come across the border and petition for their uh, right to asylum. Uh, what apparently happened was the, the jail people did, kept everyone locked in while a fire broke out. It was a protest fire, a burning mattress, uh, 38 people, people killed. Pay attention to immigration. Let's get something that works for everybody. On the sports front, real quickly, uh, today, of day of recording, the 30th uh, is opening day for the Cubs, opening day for the Sox down in Houston. The Bulls can be exciting. They've been pretty good lately. They beat the Portland Trailblazers. They beat the Lakers. Then they lost to the Clippers and the Lakers. Uh, we're rooting for them. Hopefully, we have some more wins. And if you're following soccer and getting ready for it, the Chicago Red Stars, uh, they play at Houston uh, on today, the 1st, uh, when the show broadcasts, as well as um, actually the 1st is when they play Houston here at home, at their home stadium, uh, which is Seagate Stadium, 7000 South Harlem in Bridgeport. Uh, turn out and support the Red Stars. Uh, last week, we had renowned peace activist Kathy Kelly on. Uh, told us about the time when she was in uh, Iraq when the bombs were falling. We also had election lawyer Ed Mullen talking about the election. You can find both of those at youtube.com slash heartlandmedia slash videos. So with that, we're going to uh, take a little musical break, and we'll be back with our first guest, Angela Clay. Listen up, get ready. I'm not going to take no more. There's a revolution, a revelation going on in my soul. Buckle up. Okay, welcome back to more of the Live from the Heartland show for the week of April 1st. Uh, that was a nice little musical break. And now I'm going to bring on someone who I had on the show four years ago in her first attempt to become the Alder Woman of the 46th Ward. Uh, we're going to talk with Angela Clay, and I'm, I'm so glad to talk Uptown. You know, I lived in Uptown in 64, working for some anthropologists hanging out in alleys and gangways with old Southern white minor guys. And then I came back with Join Community Union for a number of years where we had rent strikes and marches on the police station. Uh, so we keep our eye on Uptown. We were really glad to have Hel our friend Helen Schiller be the alderwoman for a while. You tried to take over that slot four years ago, didn't quite make it, but you finished first in this year's election with, I think, 38%. So good afternoon to you, Angela Clay, and how are you? I am awesome. Thank you so much for having me. This is a full circle experience. This is awesome to be here four years later as the top contender in this race. So, so excited to be here to talk more. Thanks for having me. Well, good. Let's, uh, you know, the Sun-Times has been billing this as a, a establishment versus the progressives. And I, I think your your opponent is a woman named Kim Walls, who uh, seems to be getting a lot of support from outside. She works for Walgreens, which is kind of rough right now with Walgreens and their policy around certain pills. Um, but uh, 
You know, you've been a, uh, while she works for Walgreens, I think you've been a housing organizer. So yeah, why don't you absolutely. tell us a little bit about yourself and then we'll talk more about the race. Yeah, so this is uh, this is my home. The 46th Ward has actually uh, raised four generations of my family. We've lived here for over 80 years. I recently became a mom at the height of COVID. Shout out to all the parents listening on here. And it has been a dream come true to make sure that our community has representation in city council from our ward. I attended our public schools. I currently sit on the local school council of my former elementary, Joseph Brenneman. I graduated from the wards only high school, Uplift Community High School. It used to be Joan F. Arai Middle School, which a lot of our neighbors attended. And then I went and studied public policy at DePaul. Um, it was there that I really started to see how policy impacts people's lives. And that's where we have to get in front of making sure that we have effective policies. I was the youngest pre youngest president of a 51-year-old housing non-for-profit called Voice of the People. So oh. I was working with a very large budget, uh, over 150 units of real affordable housing uh, at a very early age. And it taught me that you have to bring every single person to the table to make sure that we are making these decisions together. I ran four years ago without any experience in working intimately on a campaign, uh, but my neighbors pushed me. They say, Angela, you are from this community. You always show up. You are at the forefront of making sure that your houseless neighbors have the resources that they need, that we are advocating for safe spaces for young people. You name it, uh, we are there. And so we ran, we came within 300 votes of actually making the runoff with no money, no campaign staff, no office. And so the work didn't stop. COVID came and it only got harder. So for uh, over three years now, we've been doing mutual aid where we give free food away to our neighbors, PPE protection. Um, and we've been fighting to make sure that this beautiful community invests in people and that we're also developing without displacing our most most vulnerable neighbors. So I am extremely proud to say four years later, we are the front runners of this race. Uh, we started out with six contenders. And a few weeks ago, we got uh, the top spot against big money. Uh, this, this race is coming down to people versus profit. And the people spoke up and said that they wanted a leader that was going to be holding to them and not outside interest. So I'm extremely proud of of our results and I cannot wait for April 4th to get here so that we can continue on as usual. Well, it's getting close. This is actually, we're recording this on the 30th, which is opening day for the White Sox and the Cubs. Mm -hmm. And uh, it is for the week of April 1st and um, election day is on to next Tuesday. So uh, people, most people will probably listen to this or see it uh, over the weekend, and who knows uh, what kind of influence our little interview may have. Um, let's uh, let's talk a little bit about Uptown. Um, for me, Uptown, you know, was filled with poor people, but it was quite a a high end kind of a community in the late '40s. I first showed up there in '64, and I thought of it as kind of hillbilly Harlem. I mean, there was a lot of Southern white migrants there. Yeah. There was also Increasing number of black people. There were increasing, there were always a number of Native Americans. And there was a small black community, I think around Clifton, uh, that little area in there. Okay. Um, tell us what the ward is like now, because I, I know that uh, there's been a lot of development and it's right by the lake and uh, it's right by public transportation yeah. and it's, uh, it's ripe for development and gentrification, et cetera. But as usual, when we have those things, we don't always take care of the uh, people who live there. And yeah. in this case, it's not a gentrification set most of the time. Tell us yeah. a little bit about Uptown. Yeah, so Uptown specifically, we are one of the most diverse wards in the entire city, maybe one of the most diverse communities on the face of the planet, honestly. We have been a... Um, we have been a home to neighbors all across this city when uh, certain parts of the city would not build 
affordable housing. We took that on and we said, we will build that for you here. We also have just been home to a diverse uh, mixture of cultures. Uh, we have neighbors who are refugees from out of this country. We have neighbors who are, you know, third generations because their families migrated over here. And that is the culture that I want to make sure that we are protecting is that we are continuing to be an open space and a home for so many different people right now, because we are a stone's throw away from the beautiful lakefront. We are within a uh, walking distance of public transportation via the red line, the purple line, the brown line now comes all the way to Wilson uh, bus transportation, any and everywhere. We want to make sure that we are showing up for people who have been here, who have been through the struggles of us changing and morphing into um, a community. We have gone through extreme gentrification, Mike, if I can be um, very frank, over the last frank, 10 years. This is the kind of show where you can let it <laughs> we, have, uh, we have lost over 2,000 units of truly affordable housing in the last 10 years. And with that has been replaced with upper luxury developments. Now, the the issue has never been about a specific type. It has only been when we are saying we want to prioritize this type of development over anything else that we could be putting here. So when developers are coming into our ward and they are saying, I want to throw up a luxury high rise, we are saying, okay, what are you building that is affordable on site? And they haven't been doing their best. They have been paying into the low income housing trust fund to avoid having to build true affordable housing in this community. And that's a problem because community and stability go hand in hand with the housing. And we can't just ignore that. As a community of families, we're only catering right now to studios and one bedrooms, right? Which our families and our public schools that are nearby are going to suffer because their families need somewhere to raise their children to send to our public schools. So right now we are at a very teetering moment where there's been a huge robust boom in development. The development has been an issue because the current zoning and development process that our outgoing alderman has is not equitable. It does not look and reflect the diversity of the community. Catwoman, right? Yep. Yep. And so now we have an opportunity as a community to say, okay, we need to be at every single decision making table when it comes to how we progress as a community. It can't just be one sided. It can't be just uh, down to how much it, your income is, because you know, who's really being impacted by the raising rents and the skyrocketing property taxes. It's our elders. Our elders are feeling the pinch right now. And so our great community that it has always been is now at a point to say, okay, are we going to continue to just let outside interests tell us what we want as a community or as neighbors? Are we going to stand together and elect someone who's going to have our best interests at heart to make sure that anything that comes through our community has our approval first? Uh, Angela Clay, um... I'm, I'm as I drive around uptown uh, or through it these days, I noticed that one school has already become condos. Uh, Stewart School lofts. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, I'm probably they'd be a nice place to live, but it's too bad that there isn't more education going on. Uh, talk a little bit about the forces uh, of development and gentrification and the money that's going into the race. Uh, to your opponent, not oh to yeah, that's um one of the biggest issues is you know we talk about you know reform, political reform, campaign reform, where we separate big money from true elections, right? Because we we hold the leaders that we elect to the same highest standards as everyone else, but unfortunately, we have allowed outside money and outside interest, specifically the folks who are profiting off of this community, to try to throw and install a candidate that they pick that is basically going to do their bidding for them. And we have had so much money, Mike, spent in this race 
against us, against the top contenders, against the community, because they are afraid. They are afraid that, again, we are going to put people first over profits. Our race is the only race outside of the mayoral race right now that has unlimited income contributions. And that is because my opponent has had over $150,000 poured into independent expenditures, um, donations to oppose us. So the income limits have been blown off, not because we have raised so much money. (laughs) It is because outside interests have said, I want to pick who your next leader is because I need them in city council to do my job. So now people are starting to wake up. They're starting to see, okay, these attack ads that I see against Angela are coming from outside charter schools. You know, like when did the charter schools get so interested (laughs) in our education in Uptown? When did they, you know, enter the conversation of the race or we have this big Get Stuff Done pack, which is, you know, being spearheaded by former Rahm Emanuel uh, consultant, which we don't know where all of this money is coming from. It's just being poured into this pack to oppose us. And it's not because they want our best interest at heart. It's not because they truly care about safe schools or safe communities or affordability. They care about their bottom dollar. So this race has really come down to people versus profit. Uh, The people of this community deserve to have ownership in the decision-making process. They deserve to have transparency around some of the things that we want to do here. And I want to make this clear that it's not that we are anti-development because that's that's never been the case. The issue has been when we are developing Are we developing equitably? Are we developing with our families in mind? Are we developing with our elders in mind and everyone in between? Angelette, uh, let me ask you, uh, uh, I got a couple of questions. Let me ask what you propose, uh, what makes you the person people should vote for and some unique things or special things you plan to introduce once you are the older person of the 46th Ward. Yeah, so I say I, I am the uh, the name on the ballot, but it is the people behind me, Mike. This has been a long time coming for generations before me. Folks who were in this community um, doing foot patrols when landlords were setting their buildings on fire to collect the insurance money and killing neighbors in the process. This has been a continuation of the Black Panther Party who was up here setting up shop to make sure that our young people had free breakfast programs. This has been a very long time coming to send someone from this community who understands what it's like. I grew up in affordable housing. I grew up in affordable housing and I'm like the poster child of why we need affordable housing because that affordability offered my family stability and a great community. And it also offered me as a young person growing up while I was in college, the stability of living somewhere that was affordable, that was safe, that was clean. And that's something that I want to make sure that we are doing and providing for future generations. I want to make sure that development is going up with on-site affordability. I want to make sure that we are building options like co-ops. I really want to look at all of the resources that we have at our fingertips and not just saying we want to continue to build luxury rentals. That's just one form of housing. Where are the other forms of housing that we could really be pushing here? I also want to make sure that we are supporting our small business owners. The 46th Ward is home to some of the most amazing uh, businesses. The, for God's sakes, I have the <laughs> have the Riviera, the Green Mill, all within walking distance. Gino's Pizza. Gina, okay, I have Michael's Pizza right here. I have Gigio's Pizza. I have some. Of the, right down, Gina, I have Gina. some of the most ethnically beautiful restaurants in our ward, and I want to make sure that we are supporting them because after COVID, a lot of them are struggling. A lot of them, unfortunately, didn't make it. 
I want to make sure that they have the support. I actually want to build a mentorship program with our young people so that they are able to get gainful employment in our small businesses in the ward and actually learn what it takes to run one. I also want to make sure that we are building strong relationships with our police officers. Our police officers right now are under some immense trauma, immense stress, and I want to make sure that as a community, they are getting not only the support that they need to do their jobs effectively, but that they are, again, getting out of their vehicles, engaging with neighbors, getting to know us, and really being a part of the community that they serve. So those are a few things that I think people really need to understand is that I was not sent from the political machine, as we call it. I was sent from the people and the people who have been in this ward and even new neighbors. I have neighbors who are They've been in this war three months and they've hopped head in first to say, I support you. I appreciate this community and I want to be a part of making it greater. And I truly appreciate that because that shows you how intentional we we are being. For God's sakes, I've got translated literature in over 10 languages to make sure that every single neighbor gets the message and that they understand that this is the type of candidacy that I'm going to carry into this office. I want to make sure that I'm being transparent, that I am being um I am being intentional about the information that I am getting in front of you and that I'm doing it with you. So I think that is what really separates us. We haven't taken any donations from big developers, any outside corporations. Our money has come from, shout out to the Chicago Teachers Union, the Illinois Nurses Association, and every neighbor in between. So a real grassroots organization. Uh, Angela, uh, we are recording this on Thursday the 30th, so it's only Friday, Saturday, Sunday for five days till election day. How does it look to you and what do you plan to do with your campaign workers for the next few days? Oh, baby, we are all hands on deck. <laughs> it looks great, Mike, if I could be completely honest. we I don't say that, um, you know, thinking that we've got this in the bag, but I do say that with all confidence in our people. What we have is something that other people, no matter who was running in this race, does not have. And those are relationships. Those are relationships that go back decades that we are able to connect with people, get in buildings that no one else can, and really motivate them to get out. And, it's a and skill you home. develop in Uptown. It uh, is. It is. Buildings. But you have you're to know. passing out literature, selling papers, <laughs> doing rent strikes. <laughs> yeah, you get to know how to. You get to know how to organize. If you are from Uptown, you are a natural born organizer. And so these past two weekends, we've had over a hundred volunteers out with us, all volunteer based, uh, coming from all across the city, coming from all parts of our ward who are dedicated to making sure that they are getting in front of neighbors, expressing that, yes, you voted for us and you got us in this top contender seat, but you have to do it again. That's the hardest thing about a runoff, Lord, is reminding people that you must come back out and vote. Uh, we are going to be spending our time doing a bunch of voter contacts. So I've got tons of meet and greets and follow-ups going on this weekend. I have a entire day set for our elders and making sure that we are getting in front of them. And then our young people, our young people are really instrumental in this race. We have been making sure that we are registering them to vote. I have first time voters coming out and voting with their grandmothers. So it's been an amazing experience. I'm, I'm truly honored. I'm humbled by all of the love and the support because it comes from neighbors. Right on, Angela Clay. I wish you a good fortune, good luck. And uh, once you are installed as the Alderwoman of the 46th Ward, I hope I get to hang out and talk to you and get you back on this show. We can do that over GGO's Pizza any day. Right on, sister. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, Have a great one. You all stay tuned for uh, the live rest of Live from the Heartland. We've got more good stuff coming up. We're going to take a musical break, and we'll be right back. Stay tuned. Listen up, get ready, I'm not going to take no more. There's a revolution, a revelation going on in my soul. Buckle up, get ready, we're not going to sit back. Okay, we're back. We're back with more Live from the Heartland uh, for the week of April 1st. And it really gives me a lot of pleasure to bring on an old friend, 
not only are we old, but we haven't seen each other in a long time. Uh, the one and only Jim Russell, a.k.a. James W. Russell. And we go back to our days in Students for Democratic Society. And we're both on an, uh, a daily email of SDS people. Uh, and there's a lot of discussion. And I see uh, his comments and the things that he's doing. I know he has a new book out which we're going to talk a little bit about. He's also been making films. So this is a kind of a first step so that I have a real strong backlog of uh, former comrades, current friends and comrades to come on the radio show. And uh, so, Jim, we're going to do a little interview. Then we're going to send it to our daily thing so everyone can see it. And who knows who else out there among the masses will be watching, listening, Googling it, doing the whole thing. How are you today? I'm good, thank you. Uh, and good where to be are on you? the show. Where are you? Uh, I am in Portland, Oregon. Oh, nice. And have things toned down a little bit there from a few years back? Uh, they have. They have. And uh, the Bulls just played you guys, I think. And I think we won. Uh, I don't know. You may be right. <laughs> well, you know, I uh, I had not known that you were such a prolific author. Uh, when I was looking up some information, I know I had read one of your books, uh, which I really loved. It was about a, a, a slave in Texas, and we'll talk a little bit about that. But then I know you have a new book out about the Labor Guide to Retirement Plans, which was published by one of our favorite publishers, Monthly Review Press. But it turns out you have eight books out, and uh, you've taught a lot of places. You've been a, um, a hotshot scholar. Uh, gone to other places to teach. Give us a little bit about yourself, where, what you did in the movement and what you've been doing since. Well, I came into the movement uh, through civil rights um, in Oklahoma. I mean, not a lot of people know that Oklahoma had um, the first lunch counter sit in of the modern civil rights movement in 1958, which predated the Greensboro one, which is more famous. And then um, it had the last major one, uh, which was in Tulsa in 1964, before the uh, first of the Civil Rights Acts. And so I, I was involved in core Congress of Racial Equality. Uh, I was in the lunch counter sit-ins, arrested three times. Um, and then um, I got involved in a project uh, integrating the schools of a nearby town, Sand Springs, which is a, a, my latest uh, video. Um, and then, and during all that time, I was a member of SDS, okay? Uh, we started a chapter at the University of Oklahoma in 1963, okay? And then um, I went into the national office of SDS, uh, was the first editor of New Left Notes uh, and spent a really exciting year working there in Chicago. And I, I have always been, you know, uh, since then uh, involved in some sort of a project. Uh, so, I, you know, I, I never became older and wiser and toned down my politics or anything like that. I mean, that was just a tremendously formative period for me. And hey, where did you teach? Well, I've taught all over the place. Uh, I taught at San Francisco State. Um, I taught at Lewis and Clark in Portland. Uh, I taught at the National Autonomous University in Mexico City for two years. Um, and then I taught at Eastern Connecticut State University. And last, my last uh, place was Portland State. Uh, I gave a talk there many years ago. I think Roger Lippman brought me up there to speak way, way back. Um, I love Oklahoma. I used to think of it as a, a you know, there there was a, the Green Corn Rebellion in Oklahoma, where yeah. blacks and Mexicans and Indians and some whites all stood up to conscription for the sec First World War. And, uh, you know, and then we have a friend who uh, wrote that book, Red Dirt, Oklahoma. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Roxanne yeah. Dunbar. Yeah, Roxanne. And uh, 
we got to get her on. But let's uh, let me. Um, one of the first communiques you had or contacts we had again in recent years was when you got me a copy of your novel uh, about it's called Escape from Texas, a novel of slavery and the Texas War of Independence. And, um, you know, that was, you know, it, it came out in 2012. It goes back to 1828 when there was still slavery. But I think Mexico had gotten rid of slavery. Tell us a little bit about that book and how you came to do it. Well, um, I think the best single book about the Southwest is still Kerry McWilliams' 1949 book, North from Mexico, okay, about how, you know, long before the Pilgrims, there were people who migrated up into what is now the United States. And in that book, there is one short paragraph where he says that uh during the 1820s and 1830s there was a small community of escaped slaves in Matamoros Mexico okay, it's a very short paragraph and that had always fascinated me and so i decided to research it how big was this and to the best that i can judge there were probably more slaves that escaped south to Mexico than north to Canada, okay, even though the Underground Railroad and all that is much more famous, because it, it, it makes sense geographically, because uh, Mexico is contiguous to the south. And uh, so I, I did a lot of research on it, and I thought, well, what am I going to do with all this research? And I thought, mm -mm, why don't I just tell it as a story? Yeah, okay, and make some characters to represent the major historical uh, forces that were in operation at that time. You know, whites that were coming in from the U.S., Mexican communities, Indians, and of course, slaves. Because when you look at the Texas War of Independence, which is this, you know, shrine in American history. You know, the Alamo, you know, and you, you look at what that was all about. It, it wasn't really about freedom and independence, no. except for the slave owners. That's because right. the first thing the Republic of Texas did when it wrote its constitution was to legalize slavery. And then slavery expanded fivefold after that. So, you know, I I took the angle of the slaves who escaped, but also tried to portray all of those kinds of events. Uh, it's a great book, and uh, if you have a copy of it, any of you people listening or watching, it's worth some money. I was looking it up today, and I, you know, I can't find my copy. I probably loaned it to someone. Said this is a great book. Read it. Uh, I don't know where it is, but I saw that a used paperback copy of that book uh, was one hundred and nine dollars this morning. Oh, that's a so, rip off. Um, so I, I'm sure it is. Uh, maybe you got copies you can make a buck. Um, well, I can tell you where to get it is Sloan Publishing. Get it straight okay. from the publisher. Good. Uh, you know, one of the things now, since we're focusing out here on Oklahoma a little bit, um, you did, you most recently have been involved with a civil rights film, uh, which about desegregation when it came to Sam Springs. Tell us a little bit about that work how you got into making film and what that film is about. Well, um, in 1964, after the Tulsa sit-ins, I was living in Sand Springs, which is just outside of Tulsa. And I noticed that the schools were still completely segregated 10 years after Brown versus Board of Education. So I, uh, the, once the Civil Rights Act passed at the end of uh, July in uh, 1964, I brought, we were having a core meeting and looking around for what to do next. And I raised the question of Sand Springs. And they said, sure, go. And so a couple of people uh, agreed to help with it. And we went out canvassing in the community 
um, and found a lot of interest in integrating the schools. And so we were building up for a community meeting, and this leads to my favorite civil rights story. And uh, we were in this small hamlet called uh, outside of Sand Springs, and they said, well, you ought to go talk to Mr. Haynes. And I knew who Mr. Haynes was. Mr. Haynes was Marcus Haynes. Okay, he was the dribbler on the on the Harlem Globetrotters. Okay, and is is a member of the NBA Hall of Fame okay, at this this point. Okay, so he's a very very famous person who had grown up in Sand Springs, and despite his world fame, his children weren't allowed to go to the white schools of Sand Springs. So we went to his house, nobody home. Okay, but left a note talking about this community meeting that evening. So community meeting is there. People are debating back and forth whether to go for integration. Uh, teachers are opposed to it. Parents are in favor of it. Um, and then uh, somebody stands up and says, we don't need integration because a lot of uh, very accomplished people have you know, gone through our school and mentions Hart Marcus Haynes. Then this voice comes from the back of the church. Wait a second, I want to speak. As this man makes his way to the front, and it's Marcus Haynes. And he, and he says, it's true that I've been very successful in life because I had a very unusual skill, but I never wanted to be a basketball player. I wanted to be a printer, but I couldn't be a printer because the white school had a printing school, had a printing program, but our school did not. And so he won that argument with a dunk shot, so to speak. And he was then selected as a spokesperson for the group because he, there was nothing they could do to him. You know, he was not vulnerable. You know, he owned his, by that time, he owned a team called the Harlem Magicians. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. So he, he, he was untouchable. And so we all went to the school board meeting. They um, refused. And then we filed the first complaint in Oklahoma under the new Civil Rights Act. The U.S. attorney contacted the school board, and they immediately collapsed. And, um, you know, uh, the school, the school was integrated. Well, that story generally got lost over the years. And in the last three or four years, I've managed to contact black students from the integration and white students who were in the school. And we put up a historical marker in the school commemorating that event. So this video is about the 1964 event, and then the commemoration of it with a historical marker. So it's a video that people can get at, or do you have to buy it or find it? Um, there, there is a trailer of it on YouTube, and um, probably within days, I'm going to put up a, a way to buy a DVD of it. Oh, this is great. I'm looking forward to it. You know, I always did like Oklahoma. I think I said that earlier. Uh, but I always am kind of uh, troubled by how Oklahoma had a strong socialist base in the early 1900s. And it's now, aside from its marijuana growing, uh, right. it's which it's really over the top, growing a lot of marijuana. Uh, but it's really a kind of a conservative right-wing red state. That may not be true of uh, Tulsa or Oklahoma City. Can you give us a little hint on why uh, Oklahoma went from being in the forefront of being a progressive kind of state to being one of the most reactionary? Well, it went from red to red, but different meanings of red, right? The wrong, a good red to the bad red. <laughs> right, exactly, exactly. Um, I don't have a nifty theory of it, but I'll correct you in one detail. Good. <laughs> about Tulsa and Oklahoma City voted Republican. They there did. Was, huh? There was no redeeming virtue 
all 77 counties voted Republican. I, look, I even went down to the precinct level, looking for not even Norman, the university town, you know, voted Democrat, um, or Stillwater, another university town. Uh, I went down to the precinct level, and every once in a while you'd see, you know, a, you know, a, a Democratic precinct, but by and large, they would, it was just a sea of red. So it, it's unlike Texas, where the big towns vote Democrat. And then the suburbs and the exurbs are the ones that vote Republican. Um, Oklahoma is just across the board. Now, that said, um, there is probably a third to 40 percent of the people in Oklahoma vote Democrat. You know, so it's not like it's just a total. You know, well, that's probably another desert. case of severe gerrymandering, too. Well, I don't even think they have to gerrymander. They don't have to. Yeah. Well, we're striking out on finding a good point for Oklahoma. So <laughs> let's move on. You know, uh, in addition to that, the movie you made, uh, Desegregation came when Desegregation came to Sam Springs. Uh, were you also involved with a film about the Wisconsin Teachers Assistant strike from back in the day? Right, right. Um, tell, us, tell our listeners about that, because I'm sure there's a lot of film buffs, including our engineer, who uh, probably would want to go see that film. <laughs> well, it in 1970, um, the uh, Wisconsin Teaching Assistance Association had the first TA strike in the history of the United States. And um, I was a member of it, uh, as were two other people. And none of us had ever made a film. And so uh, but we decided to try to make a film because this was a historical event. And so I think we set a world record for low budget films you know for under four hundred dollars we made this <laughs> film and i hate to say it it was a really terrible film uh, it was a good example of bad left-wing filmmaking and so it kind of became very quickly lost or so i thought um then um after i retired I had always felt very badly about that film. And so I decided to, there was a lot of good stuff in it, okay, but kind of the way it was structured and all of that, you would have had to have been there to even understood it. Uh, so I uh, re-edited it to make it more relevant to graduate student organizing today. And I, I, I think it's a halfway decent film. I'm going to watch it. Uh, Jim Russell, James uh, Russell, James W. Russell. I know a lot of Jim Russells. I know two other guys. Oh, there was really? one in Rising Up Angry who was a Korean War vet, late, mm -hmm. and then there's another guy who is a fireman in town here. Mm -hmm. But uh, you got the W, and um, one of the things we talked about most recently was your new book. Uh, right. Why don't you give us a little bit about this, and we'll let the other uh, six books that you've written go to another time, but tell us a little about this, and then I want to get at uh, a couple other things before we close out. Sure. Um, I never would have predicted when I was in SDS that I'd become totally fascinated with retirement plans. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, but I have. Um, I was involved in leading a movement in Connecticut in. Uh, from about 2008 to 2013, which resulted in us being able to change out of a 401k plan, uh, which would have had a miserable retirement with it, to the state's pension plan. It was one of the few victories like that because everybody's being pushed in the opposite direction. And you know, something like $400 uh, million then changed from the 401ks into the state um, pension fund. And during that, I encountered, it, it was a rank and file uh, union movement. And during that, I encountered a lot of union people who uh, really didn't know very much about retirement plans, as important as they are to working people. And so I, the, the premise of the book is to write a book um, that's from the point of view of working people 
not from the point of view of the financial services industry, the banks, the insurance companies, and all the others that profit off of retirement plans, but from working people and what, what people basically need to know about Social Security and workplace retirement plans. Well, I do. I am in the Screen Actors Guild, and I'm really glad I got enough work in to get a pension from them. Um, mm -hmm. But a lot of people are really concerned, and you know. And as we live longer, I can see a lot of people wondering how they're going to get by. Um, uh, James Russell, let's uh, go to uh, uh, we uh, on our SDS daily Munique, where a lot of people. Um, someone raised this film that was just on PBS and I saw it last night or I think it was last night. Uh, and it is about, uh, I'm, I'm pulling a blank here, but it's a, it's a film about, uh, it's called the mad men, uh, the movement and the mad men. Let's start over Cal. Uh, you know, some of the people on our, our SDS, uh, email site daily have been talking about a film that PBS just showed, called The Movement and the Madman. And it's about the anti-war movement, a lot after kind of SDS had done a bunch of stuff. Why don't you give us a short take on what you thought about the film and why it's important for people to watch it? Well, uh, you may have noticed that when you go back to the great movements of the 1960s, civil rights, anti-war, women's movement, that um, civil rights and women's movement are uh, Okay, they yeah. were good and noble, okay, but somehow the anti-war movement has been dropped out of the picture um, and is somewhat suspicious. And that's probably because we're continuing to fight wars. And so it's not a great example for those who promote those wars. So I think that, that this film is a wonderful antidote to that uh, because it, it really, uh, Steve Talbot and the people we worked with collected an enormous amount of footage um, and really showed how big and vibrant um, that movement was. And they also uh, claim that it was responsible for stopping Nixon and Kissinger from using nuclear weapons in Vietnam. Okay. So I, I, I think overall it's, it's, a, it's a tremendous film. My only criticism of it is that it seemed to overly emphasize the role of Harvard University in a couple of seminars where people came up with the idea of this mobilization. Um, and then most of the universities that were portrayed were private universities rather than public. And so it kind of tilted it up in terms of what this movement was. It also did not have very much context about the prior marches on Washington okay, or the just widespread you know, set of activities around the country. And so you kind of got a sense, I don't know, maybe I'm being a little bit overdramatic, that this was a Harvard project or something like that. And so I, I was critical of that. that. That could have been easily fixed. but Yeah, I have a there. feeling they'll show that movie a bunch. I know in some places they didn't show it yet, uh, but it's worth seeing. We're going to run out of time, Jim, but uh, I'm going to ask you, fire one last thing at you. Um, and of course, I'm inviting you back right now to come on. Whenever you want to come on, you've got something you want to share. Uh, we okay. can do this more often. But where do you see the nation right now? I know this is rough in a short amount of time. But where do you see the nation and what do you think people should be doing, people of conscience? Well, I'm very uh, pessimistic at the moment because of this war that's going on. Um, it's a war that was started by two wrongs, NATO expansion and a Russian invasion. And right. it seems like the vast majority of people are looking for a victory in it rather than uh, a way to negotiate an end to it. And if you're looking for a victory, it's going to go on for a long, long time. Uh, and so, yeah, and then we have, we look at the two political parties, 
the Democrats are essentially the war party, as they were in 1968, you know, the Chicago Convention, and the Republicans are a kind of neo-fascist party. And so, you know, there's not a lot of options in there. Um, so I, I don't have a magic solution to this, but don't give up. You know, I mean, history <laughs> always, you know, surprises you. And maybe, you know, we will find some light at the end of this particular tunnel. Well, I certainly hope so. I know we got an election coming up here that gives us a stark contrast between a progressive African-American, uh, Johnson, running against Vallis, who's really a Republican. And uh, who would have thought that this would rear its ugly head again? But, uh, you know, I do believe uh, things... I used to be a meliorist. I believed that things would get better. And uh, but it's not necessarily so. But I'm working that way. And I think in a lot of parts of the country, there are a lot of very aware young people, as well as older people like you and I. And uh, we're all doing something to try to make it a better place. So I know you'll be doing good in the world. I'll keep trying and we'll look forward to talking to you again soon, James. Thanks a lot. Okay, thanks a lot, Mike. All right. Uh, we're going to close out now. It was great talking to Jim Russell and to Angela Clay. Uh, next week, I'm not sure who we have, but we do have coming up in the next few weeks, uh, John Melrod talking about his new book, Fighting Times, about organizing up there in Racine and Kenosha in the old days. And we're going to have Gordon Mantler talking about the multiracial promise, and that's about Harold Washington's election. Um, I want to thank everyone for tuning in. I want to thank the people who make this show possible. Certainly Hal James, the engineer, Katie Hogan and Tom Clark, sometimes hosts and producers, Lynn Orman. And um, there's a lot to do out there. You know, we have an election on Tuesday, just a few days after this show starts to be aired. Um, you can really still make a difference, whether you're in the 46th Ward or whether you're in the 48th Ward, calling for the people you're rooting for. And certainly in the uh, mayoral election, tell people that uh, we're not looking forward to going backward. We want to go forward. We want to have schools that are public and not uh, privatized, et cetera, et cetera. We'll be talking next week because we'll know a whole lot more about what went on. Uh, I want to encourage you to... Uh, do sports and not war like Athletes United for Peace. And I want to encourage all of you to do good in the world because the world needs all the good that you do, that I do, that we do together. All power to the people. Have a great and productive week. Are you doing the best you can? Over the mountain, under the big blue sky, you got a dream awaiting. I can see it in your eye It may not come easy But you know you've got a friend I'll be by your side the entire ride Just let me hear you say amen Are you doing, doing Are you doing the best you can? Mm -hmm. Tell me, are you doing Are you doing the best you can? Mm -hmm. Too done, ask her too done. Le meilleur de toi-même, parce que tu l'aimes. Too done, ask her too done. Le meilleur de toi-même. you can <laughs> tell me are you doing